Hello, good evening, good day to everyone there, and also hello to you too, Marcos. Hey, Motlu, how are you all? We hope you guys all had a great previous lesson, and we're once again on a Sunday evening US time, or like 3 a.m. here Israel time. Um, and we're moving forward with the fundamental course. So today we're on lesson number four, and it's quite an important lesson, actually. Uh, it's about how we perceive reality. Um, as usual, we're going to go ahead with this book. So we're going to read quite a few things from this book. Plus, if you've got the Shamati book, that will also come in handy. So it might be worthwhile keeping it on the side of your table while we carry on with the lesson. Um, as usual, please forward all your questions on the chat box. We'll do our best to answer them uh, as, as best we can. And if there's anything we missed, I'm sure they'll be answered later on on the forum. Okay, so let's get smashing then, I guess. So today is the perception of reality. How do we perceive reality? Are we living a dream? Uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, this is just a dream world. We, we come here, live like we're in a dream, and then we just pass away. And all that's left are some kind of fading memories. Um, but if you think about it, you know, sometimes when we're in our sleep, we dream, and you wake up in the morning and you think, wow, that was like, you know, by the time you come back to your senses, it's like during, during the day that you realize that you were actually dreaming, but it felt so, so real. Okay, so the Kabbalists have brought us an explanation for that, just as many scientists did in the past. Now, looking at reality, how we perceive reality, has been something that humanity has been dealing with um, since, you know, the 16th. Hundreds, actually. It's an interesting time because Newton started looking at this uh, in the late 1600s. And if you also studied a bit of Kabbalah, you'll also note that that's also the time of Ari. Okay, so when the wisdom of Kabbalah had started being um, evolved into a scientific approach um, to, to uh, convey to humanity. And that's when Ari also started doing his work. So nothing is coincidental. But as you can see, humanity scientifically and the Kabbalists are walking pretty much hand in hand in parallel to try to explain to us how we live our lives. Okay. Now, so we have a few things to look at today. And what we're going to do is first see how we develop from, uh, from the scientific point of view. And then we'll look at what we've got um, in terms of Kabbalistic explanations and the Kabbalistic approach to perceiving reality. So first of all, like I said, we had a guy called Newton, and I'll do my best to write clearly. Okay, I apologize from the beginning, as it is not easy to write here. Okay, so we had Newton in the 1600s, late 1600s, okay, and he said, well, there's me, Okay, and there is reality. Okay, so if we can show the board, Bill, that'd be great. There we go. Okay, yeah, nice. Okay, so Newton in the 1600s said, There is me. Okay, there's me. I'm looking at the world, and I'm thinking, Well, the reality is just as it is, you know, and I am as I see it. So Newton said, I don't change, I'm not changing, I am constant. Okay. This is how I see the world. I have five senses, and this is how I see it. And then I'm looking at the world, right? And people come and people go. You know, new babies are born, they have a life, they live, and they see what I see, they hear what I hear. When I eat that apple, they taste, you know, I can pretty much imagine they taste what I'm tasting, okay, uh, about sweet things, bitter things. And then when we touch things, they feel pretty much what I'm feeling. So Nissan thought, well, reality doesn't change, and the way we perceive it doesn't change. So everything is, you know, constant. And that was his explanation to reality. This is just how it is. People are born, they live, and according to their five senses, they perceive the world, and then they end up dead. And after they end up dead, well, what do we say? We say, life goes on. Okay, and that's his idea of, that was his idea of being constant. 
Okay, so this is, this is also how we look at the world as well, right? A lot of us, even though science has developed since Einstein and since the 1930s in quantum physics, we still like looking at the world and thinking like Newton, right? We see the same things, feel the same things, taste the same things. People come, people go. We came, we're living, we're going to go. And think the world just carries on. Okay, this is actually how we look at the world as well. Okay, and then Einstein came along. Einstein, let's put Einstein here. And he came in the 1900s, the early 1900s. Okay, and he said, well, wait a minute. I change because I can see the world differently. Okay, this is his theory of relativity. That he said that the way I see the world is subjective. Why did he say that? Because the way we feel the world, even though we see common things, is different. Okay, the sensations we get are different. Okay, some people like chocolate, some people like, I don't know, salty stuff. Some people have an aspiration, I know, for art, and when they look at a piece of art, they feel things and see things that a normal, regular guy is not really interested in art, looks at it and goes, okay, you know, somebody made some picture, great, big deal, wow, you know, what's the million dollars for, okay? So the way we perceive and feel the world, he says, is, is different from person to person. So he said, well, I change. So this is subjective. And he said, accordingly, reality is same old, okay? Once again, constant. All right, and after that, after Einstein's theory, also, you know, not a lot of people still understand Einstein's theory. You know, when we're talking about relativity, although a lot of people write about it, only a handful of people really, really grasp that idea of how things are really subjective in the way I see things. Okay? So it's still not something you know, very clear to the majority of humanity. That's why we look at life still like Newton. You know, it's like pretty basic. You know? I live, I see, I hear, I taste, and end up dead. And so does everybody else, but life goes on. You know, that's where the term life goes on comes from because we think things just carry on as usual. Okay? And then we have quantum physics. Quantum physics. Now, quantum physics is from the 1930s. Whoops. And these guys said about reality, they said, well, wait a minute. If the way I look at life and see life, this is after Einstein, right, is subjective, and if the way I see things are changing due to my perception, it's really not possible that reality will be as it is, right? It can't be constant. So there's kind of a mutual change, okay? So if I'm changing in the way I see things, I'm actually causing that reality to change. Okay, so they said, well, I change, and so does reality. Okay. I change, and reality changes. Now, this is all known, all right? But we're just going over it. Okay? In the beginning of the lesson, we're just going over it so we have like a foundation of what perception of reality is according to how humanity has come to work with this concept of perception. And then we have Kabbalah, right? Well, 
Kabbalah is a bit of a drama. Okay, so Kabbalists have explained to us, well, what, since from the 2000s? Okay, <laughs> this is like from the book of Zohar. So since Zohar, they've been writing about it. And this is after the destruction of the second temple. So this is like 2,000 years ago. Okay. And they, these guys are saying, listen, there is a reality. Okay. Oops, sorry. There is a reality. And there is the guy who's in reality, that's us, okay, me, okay, and this is all a big question mark. To be quite honest, okay, also when we start studying Kabbalah, we come to Kabbalah with that question mark about me as well, don't we? We say, who am I? Who is me? Okay, so the Kabbalists kind of started talking about it and explaining to us in the book of Zohar, like pretty much thousands of years ago, about these two things. And this is what we're going to look at today, okay? How we can have an approach, okay, Kabbalistically, to the perception of reality. Right. Now, before we go on, we're going to read. So if you could please turn to this book, page 424, and what item do we have? 34. Okay, so I'm going to read, and please do follow if you've got the book in front of you. Take, take our sense of sight, for example. We see a wide world before us, wondrously filled but in fact, we see all that only in our own interior. In other words, there is a sort of photographic machine in our hind brain which portrays everything that appears to us and nothing outside of us. For that, he has made for us there in our brain a kind of polished mirror that inverts everything seen there so we will see it outside our brain in front of our face, yet what we see outside us is not a real thing. Okay, this is from the preface to the book of Zohar, written by Baal HaSulam himself as an introduction to the book of Zohar. So this is quite a strong paragraph, because if you think about it, what he's really saying is, Oops, if I can just grab a new page, thank you. Um, basically what he's saying is there is nothing on the outside, okay? It's just how I feel inside me. So basically what the Kabbalists are saying here is this. Let's, oops, let's do this. here. And let's have five. Okay, so the Kabbalists are saying basically, listen guys, we have five senses and this is how we get influenced from the outside. Okay, so outside of us, as Balasam just wrote here, he says there is nothing really, okay? But if there is nothing, 
there must be some kind of an influence on us. Okay, so there's an influence on us that makes us see things which are inside of us as if they were outside of us. So we have the sun, we have, I don't know, the moon, you know, the stars, we have the trees, and the birds, and the bees, and the animals. Okay, well, animal drawing an animal is always a challenge for me. Okay, I just have to deal with it. Okay, and a bunch of people. Okay, now obviously it's hard to grasp this at the moment, right? Because I see everything outside of me. But ba what Baba Islam is saying is this. What we feel, what we see on the outside is only a reflection of the sensations, the thoughts and the desires that I'm going through and I'm living inside. And outside of us, there is nothing else except an influence that makes me see everything that's inside of me as if it's right in front of my face. This is why on the outside when we talk about reality, Kabbalists are not really talking about what's on the outside, but on that influence that comes to us from the outside, which they call, I think by now you should be familiar with, is called... Just draw this in yellow, okay? They call it light. Now, light, although we use this word for the creator, okay, it's talking about his influence on us. And a key word that we need to know while studying Kabbalah is a word called Atzmuto. Okay. Now, Atzmuto, oops, how did I spell that word? Okay, sorry about that, guys. Atz means the creator's essence okay now when we look at the world the reason we're talking about this is is um, is important Atsmuto, meaning the essence of the creator it's very important to understand that right because just like in this world we don't really understand the essence of anything we also do not understand the essence of the creator so Atsmuto is something we don't talk about but how his essence through the light influences us is very important because the light then becomes for us, okay, his actions or his influence. Also very important to keep in mind, his actions. According to the Creator's actions upon me, me at the back of my head, this is the back of my brain, okay, just like he said here in the article, back of the brain, I depict to myself a world called this world. Okay, equals this world. Now we have to add up a little bit from the things we learned in our previous lessons. We spoke before that our nature is just a desire to receive. So what we do is always absorb things. So if I am a desire to receive and I'm always absorbing things, what basically I'm doing is, according to my clea, my five senses, 
all I do is get things into my Kli. Okay? Through my five senses. All I'm doing is receiving. Okay? Pretty much what I just drew here. So everything is basically inside this vessel of reception. And because we're all in this re vessel of reception, and because, if you will recall, we are all part of one soul, we all see similar things, hear similar things, taste similarly, feel similarly, because we're all part of an integrated system. Okay? And the Creator's influence on that integrated system is perceived differently by every part of that individual system. Just like bees have a different perception, dogs have a different perception, we also have a different perception. And how we feel through the five senses of common perception inside all of us is different. Therefore, to determine reality, what is truth and what is not truth, can only be specifically defined according to an individual and how that individual attains the actions of the Creator inside his vessel. Okay? Piece of cake, right? That's just how it is. Now, the Kabbalists are saying, this is all great, so we perceive everything in our five senses and we all see the world and feel the world even though in the same way we have a different sensation from it. That's all well and good, but how are we going to now flip this so we can actually come out of this dream world that we're living in inside our own head and feel the Creator which is outside of us? All right. Maybe we can just summarize a few things till this point. Because um, we was moving on to the next point. So what we talked about at the start of the lesson, well, really, first, of all, first and foremost, we're talking about perception of reality, how we perceive reality. So even before we even continue, uh, Mutlu is really touching on the point now of why it's even important that we study this topic. You know, well, you know, I perceive reality a certain way, so what, what does it matter to me really defining how I perceive reality, really defining how we perceive reality? <clears throat> so Mutlu is really coming to the point now where uh, Kabbalah is saying that after going through all this development in science, where we had the Newtonian perception, which is really the face value perception, you can say that every person in the world really perceives reality uh, at that Newtonian level of perception, whether we want to or not, from the time we're babies and onwards. It's this face value type of perception where I can say that, you know, this is a, this is a computer here in front of me. That's a computer screen right there. You know, this is a shirt. And uh, I can point to things and as if say objectively that all these things are what they are. That's, that's more or less the Newtonian perception and we do that all the time. If we're not really thinking any deeper, and we're just kind of going in the flow of life. So this is how we perceive reality at this phase of value. Then, uh, the, this next point in science, Einstein comes along and really starts scrutinizing uh, the things deeper. Also, we have to understand as well, similar to how we studied about the development of desires, that, you know, as, just as desire develops, so what, why would even Einstein come along and, and question perception of reality? It's the same as us here. Why are we coming along and questioning perception of reality? Because if we think about our desires developing, so obviously Einstein comes along and that Newtonian perception w wasn't satisfying enough. If, if everyone was satisfied by that, that, that Newtonian level of perception, so we'd all just continue living in that. And as long as we're satisfying our desires, we'll, we'll, we'll always stay in that. But what, what causes a person to search onwards for something new, for a different way of looking at things? Uh, it's simply the, the growth of the, the desire. So the growth of the desire comes along. It expresses itself in some person called Albert Einstein who comes and finds out in a scientific way that uh, it's not that I can say that this here is a computer in front of me and I can't really say that this is anything uh, just by pointing at something and saying that is this, this is that. 
but he comes along and says that I perceive that this is a computer, and I, I can say that I perceive that this is a, a keyboard, meaning that it's always from my perception that I perceive it a certain way, and I can't say anything about it in, in reality. And then we continue on and on. Quantum physics comes along, makes things even more complicated for us, says that you know, just by looking at something, I'm actually changing that thing too. So my, my perception of something influences the something itself. And there's all kinds of experiments that were done from just from looking, you know, even on a macroscopic level, people you know, looking out into, into space, influencing the way things move in space. Microscopic level too, just by perceiving things, you know, the observer's perception of, of all kinds of micro elements changes the functioning of those elements, all kinds of things like this happened. And then what, what we're saying is that this is kind of like a development in humanity or a development in science and how, how science is constantly coming closer, literally, to what Kabbalah talked about over 2,000 years ago, or you could say 5,000 years ago, when, when Kabbalah was first discovered, where really what Motlu has reached here is that subjectively we can say that we, there is this subjective perception of, of a reality. But reality itself, what is that reality? Whether it's constant, whether it's changing, Kabbalah says no, there is no reality that only my perception is what, I can, is, is what I can point to, meaning that there's this constantly changing perception of reality, and that's it, about some kind of reality being outside our senses. We can't say anything about that, meaning that there is nothing out like that. What Kabbalah says is there is actually this, as Mutlu wrote, this abstract upper light, as it's called, which is constantly acting on our senses. And then when, and then we went on to the next point, uh, going on about the five senses, saying, how, okay, so how do we perceive reality uh, in our current state? So through the five senses, sight, smell, touch, hearing, taste, and that gives us all kinds of images in our hindbrain, as Bala Sulam wrote. All that comes from what Kabbalah says is the light, his actions, as it's, as it's written there. Uh, but if we take a moment not to say that it comes from the light at this point, so really as well, science has also defined that. Science too today uh, will also tell you that we perceive reality through our five senses, sight, smell, touch, hearing, taste. Uh, and what the, the point here that science kind of reaches, this boundary which it can't get beyond, is what brings that perception into being. What, what, what actually bring, brings that about? What, what's causing this perception? What causes this selection to take place, which activates that whole system of, of perception? What, 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 what's actually causing it? What's bringing it into place? And this is what we're about to get on to now, that the, that the whole, that causal thing there that, that's activating this whole system of perception, all these five senses, etc., cetera, to, to come into place is the desire to receive pleasure. What we said is the matter of creation, that, that desire to receive that pleasure which is called the light. And uh, at the moment we're in this mode where we're constantly wanting to receive that pleasure for myself. So we're absorbing all that information into that, into that desire and, and that's why we perceive the way we do. Meaning that our five sensors are five receptors. We're always receiving, constantly receiving information from some unknown external source. So that, that's the mode we're perceiving now. So in this situation, how do we actually define that it's this will to receive pleasure, this desire to receive pleasure, bringing this whole perception into existence? That's really what we're going to get into now, that, that when we work on ourselves to come into equivalence of form with that external influence, which at the moment is unknown, but as Kabbalah says, if we do work in order to come into equivalence with that light that's at the source of this whole perception, so then we start actually discovering that quality of the light and we start discovering how it's actually, that is that same creator that we talk about, that's the same quality of bestowal and love, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So Kabbalah really takes it to the next level between that boundary where science has reached and can actually start talking about the causal things that are bringing this whole system into existence. And how can we talk about the causes? By having a method by which we attain those causes. So, Absolutely. Just one short thing I'd like to read 
from Shamati, Shamati 21. It's just a short paragraph, but it's quite powerful. Um, and it says there, on page 21, if you've got your Shamati book handy, it's the white book, The Matter of Spiritual Attainment, um, on page 21. It says, we do not speak of Atzmato, his essence, at all. This is because the root and the place of the creatures begin in the thought of creation where they are incorporated. The reason I wanted to touch on this is this. Marcos touched on that point about how we're going to come to the equivalence of form. And in our previous lesson, okay, at least the one you guys did with me, we talked about how, our, okay, how the Creator brought us here from the world of infinity, okay, from perfection, through the five worlds into this world, right? Adam Kadmon, Atsilut, Briya, Yitzira, Asya. These were the five worlds. And as we discussed before, so we're all created here. And our process here, just in a nutshell, was to go through that human development, okay, with our increasing egoism and come to that pinnacle point Okay, development where the dot in the heart finally awakens. Okay, here, and we start if we study in Kabbalah our spiritual um, path back. Okay, to perfection. And we mentioned in that lesson before that here what changes is our consciousness. Okay, that we consciously attain the Creator by our spiritual work. Now, the next point that we're touching on right now is that equivalence of form. How am I actually going to start snapping out of this dream world and start really perceiving real reality, which is the Creator's influence on me, in order to have this relationship with Him? And creating that equivalence of form through the study of Kabbalah, as we studied before, is by the light that reforms. Okay, so through the study of Kabbalah, what we get is the light that reforms, which influences us and draws us up here. Now, when we come to attain our first degree, let's say here, okay, that's the first point of equivalence of form, meaning that I, at the minimum level, equalize my attribute from reception to bestowal. Now, remember, when we're talking about the creator, let's, let's put down here the creator, okay? The reason I want to write creator here is, you'll see in a minute, okay, creator is how he did things. And he created everything, just like it says in the books, from scratch, right? He created out of nothing a desire to receive and he wanted to fulfill it with light, which is pleasure. So when we're studying Kabbalah, what we're actually doing is, like Marcos said, there is no reality. What we're doing is building one from scratch, just like he built it from scratch. And that's how we get to the equivalence of form. Okay, how am I going to equalize myself with the Creator? By doing actually exactly what He did. He created a reality from scratch, which is what I perceive in this world. Now I have to be, in order to be like Him, create a reality just like He created it, but this time in bestowal. And to do that is to attain the equivalence of form, which is to bestow just like he's bestowing on me, all right? And from that comes the word bore. Now, bore means the creator, okay? It's equal to that in Hebrew. Why is it important to know this term? Because bo means come and re means see. It means I have to actually come and see the truth, okay? And that's how we develop in spirituality, by this thing called coming and seeing, bestowal, 
higher and higher in every degree and actually attaining it and becoming a bestowal action. Just like the Creator's influence of bestowal, I also become that influence on reality. And that's what it means to be a partner to the Creator in creation. And that is the purpose of our creation, the purpose that man was created. Okay, so this, now, as you can see now, we're bringing the past lessons into, you know, building that, building that jigsaw puzzle. So by the end of this fundamentals course, you should have in front of you like a picture of what Kabbalah is, how to study, what to do and what to attain. All right. So it's very important that you don't miss the previous lessons because now we're adding, you know, piece by piece, block by block into that, into that spiritual foundation so we can move forward. So through our historical development, just like also Marco said a minute ago about Einstein, what is Einstein? Well, if you think about it, Einstein is a part of us which developed a certain level of consciousness that began to understand that I change. And what did the quantum physicists add it to that? It's another level of consciousness in humanity. Well, reality changes. Now, as the point in the heart awakens in a lot of people in society, we're learning from Kabbalists that, wait, wait a minute, I have to change in order to create a different reality. And this is all human development from thousands and thousands of years in our development. Okay, so we've been moving along since the dawn of creation, reincarnating, 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 until that glorious moment of awakening in the dot in the heart. And from there on, this is how we're going to build that new reality. Questions? Uh, maybe before we go into questions, we might look at the video clip of Rav. Absolutely, actually. Oh, I'm sorry I missed that. We were actually <laughs> supposed to give this in the beginning. My apologies. Sorry about that. We have a beautiful clip from the Rav. Let's see what our Rav has to say. All the worlds, the upper as well as the lower, including our world, are inside of us. That's because we, overall, perceive everything. All parts of reality according to our properties. The upper light is around us, there are no changes in it, no shades. But according to how we change our properties, that's what determines how we sense changes. And it seems to us that the world is full of people and objects and forces, and that everything happens, behaves, evolves, changes. But in actuality, this is not true. In truth, if we could see ourselves as if looking from the side, like seeing as though we had different properties, we would see that there actually is nothing there, that each of us is a black box, a closed system that can only feel what occurs inside of it, not outside. We are impressed by our inner properties, and our inner properties divide into the upper world and the lower world. The upper world is called our altruistic properties, if we can acquire them and feel them within ourselves. The lower world, our world, is, if we feel ourselves as we now feel, we can call this our egoistic properties, in our desire to enjoy and to receive. And therefore, there is nothing outside of us as we imagine, that there are worlds, and that there's such a world that seems to be outside of us, and it's not true, it's an illusion. And so it is with everything else that we imagine. Everything is actually a product of our imagination. We, as scientists have proven, see with our eyes an inverted image, which is then reinterpreted by our brain. It's the same with our inverted vision that causes us to see everything outside of us while actually it's inside of us. It's just my impression that makes me think that the world is outside of me. 
Okay, so we've gotten a few questions in. Uh, Anne from Peru is asking, can we get out of our own sense of perception of reality and will we know when we achieve this? Absolutely. That's the whole idea, okay? That's, the, that's actually the whole idea. The whole idea of us being in this world and perceiving reality in our vessel of reception, which is egoism, um, is so that we can actually get out of it. And at that time, when you do that, you begin to perceive reality in two ways. You don't, you know, scrap and delete this world, but you add on to this world a new approach, a new way of looking at things. It's like, um, it's like you know, the Rob just said a minute ago, we live in this box, all right, in our perception of reality. We're in this box and we're stuck in it. And what the Kabbalists are basically saying really simply is, please, you know, get out of the box and take a look at it from a different point of view. That's all that spirituality is. And that's something we need to build um, by studying Kabbalah. So when we do that, we have two perceptions of reality. They don't change. It's just that the way we approach it changes. And as we develop more and more and more, as our consciousness increases, then the necessity to use corporeal reality decreases. Okay, until our final correction where then we don't need corporal reality at all and then it fades away from our perception of reality. But until our final correction, we do need this corporeal reality in order to develop that full, um, full perception of spirituality. Okay, uh, Joseph White from Arnold in Missouri is asking, how do we know that we have risen a degree? Easy. Okay, it's like I begin to see something I didn't see before. Okay, let's say, God forbid, we have a blind man from birth. Okay, a blind child, let's say, at the, until the age of six, seven, he's blind. Okay, but science, fortunately, has discovered a cure. So they put him on the operation table, they operate on his eyes, and he opens his eyes, and he begins to see a new world. He sees, wow, there's this thing called sun and it's it's giving me heat and then the sun goes down and then there's the moon coming up and then there's the stars oh my god there's fish in the sea this is the sea see his world changes all of a sudden all right why because an extra sen sense of perception was added to him and that's pretty obvious right so think of spirituality in layman terms pretty simple. If we keep it simple, it's much easier to understand and it's not complicated at all. Now imagine that I need a sixth sense, okay, which I'm actually lacking, but I don't feel like I'm lacking it, okay? And that's what actually the soul is. It's like I don't lack a sixth finger on my hand, okay, because five is sufficient. So when we live in our body, we don't really feel like we lack a soul or an, an extra sensation to feel something deeper. But imagine if we felt that. Imagine that everyone around us had a sixth sense and I didn't and I knew about it. It would just drive me nuts, right? Like this blind kid who just, you know, everybody's talking about things he can't see. For him it's all pitch dark. And that's exactly how it is in our situation. All right. So if we just look at it like that very pragmatically, it'll be really, you know, it'll be nice and clearly understood. Okay, Tammy from Austin, Texas is asking, through the speaking level, can an individual use the point in the heart to correct for all, or does it take all of mankind to rise back to equiv equivalence of form? Well, look, if we're all part of one soul, and it's like us being a part of one body, right? Let's say my brain functions normal, okay, but I've got no hands. So I want to do something, but I can't really do it because I can't bring my hand, hand to do what I really want to do. Right? So I can't really say I'm, I'm in a perfect state. However, my mind is functioning perfectly normal. All right? So same in spiritual, spirituality, in a spiritual aspect. So there is... A part, let's say you, who in her mind spiritually is functioning perfectly normal and don't need any addition at all. However, the rest of the soul needs something, you know, the, the, the needs the hands or needs the legs or whatever. So there is the individual 
what we call final correction. And then there's the global, the integral, the whole of the system being needed correction as well. So we need to look at that in two ways. There is me and there is my family, all right, the rest of the world. So as, as a father, as a mother, what do I have to do? I have to take care of the family so they grow and they become independent and wise just like the grown-ups. Larry from Glen Burnie in Maryland is asking, is there a method or procedure to get out of one's own box? Oh, absolutely. And there's a beautiful formula for that. I don't know if I should say it in the fundamentals course, but <laughs> you're going to hear it anyway. And it's called brotherly love. All right, now, okay, it sounds a bit weird, but let's explain what that means. You know, in the Torah, in, the, in spirituality, the biggest rule in spirituality is love thy neighbor as thyself. So we kind of look at it like a slogan, right? And we can't really understand why do I need to love others in order to perceive a new reality. But let's just think about it for a second. If I'm a, a desire to receive and all I want is to be fulfilled, okay, this is my current situation. It's all about me. Okay, this is my current situation. I can't help it. Everything I do, even when I move my hands, when I move the way I sit, everything I want is to please me. Now, studying Kabbalah is actually going to bring us to this point where we actually see that every minute thing I do, I did it for me. Okay? A lot of people outside on the street don't see that. They say, I give charity, I help people, you know. But you start studying Kabbalah, you begin to see that everything you did was just for your self-satisfaction. So the Creator decided to play a little trick on us in our perception of reality. He said, you know what? You think there is you, and outside of you there are other people even though the Kabbalists say, hey, there isn't. There's just you and the Creator, right? This is what we talked about just now. There is me and the Creator. That's all. But the Creator's influence, His light on us, gives us such a perception that there are other people living on the planet. Now, if I could have it my way, I'd just get rid of them. There's nothing but headaches, really. Okay, and I actually only use other people in my life to satisfy myself. Okay, you know, other than that, I wouldn't need them at all. If I had everything sufficiently provided by world on its own, I'd never even need these people. I wouldn't even care. I only care about other people depending on what I want to get from them. That's human nature. Egoism is me using the rest of the planet because I want fulfillment. All right. So how am I going to get out of this perception of constantly wanting to receive for myself? I'm born in it. I'm programmed in it. There's nothing I can really do about it, okay, on my own. So the creator also had a solution for that. He said, well, you know, after living through so many reincarnations and suffering so much and not knowing what the heck you're living for, finally the Creator does us a little favor. And He gives us a dot in the heart. Now this dot in the heart is an inclination to, you know, to know why we're living, what created me, who created me, and what He wants from me. This brings us to... Okay, the Creator, with this inclination, brings us to what we call the group. Which are other guys who also have a dot in the heart. Okay? So all the guys who are studying with us in Bnei Baruch, they all have a dot in the heart. Because they, they've got this big question. So, oops, didn't spell group right, did I? Oh, no. Let's do that. Thank you. Sorry about that, guys. You know, it's so tough using this stuff, really. That's the group, okay? Okay, so the Creator brings us to the group, which is 
the study as well. It's not just the friends, but we have a rav, we have a group, we have the materials. So the creator says, listen, guys, if you want to get out of your egoism, you have to, instead of helping yourself, right, like the world is your open buffet, and eat whatever and however you want, instead of thinking like that, how about building a new approach with these new tools? That instead of wanting for yourself all the time, why don't I try to bestow upon these guys? Why don't I try to help them? Okay, now this work that we do in the study of Kabbalah in order to help others advance and move forward in life is called a desire to grow our inclination for bestowal. In other words, what I'm doing by studying Kabbalah with the group, my teacher and the materials is trying to grow this guy here. And the only way he's going to grow is actually through, let me put it this way, okay, through this mechanism, okay, where also the creator is involved. So the creator is also involved in this picture. As I give effort here, okay, as I give effort, this is my effort, phase one, okay, I came to the group and I started studying. I am giving effort, I'm investing, okay, just like in a business. As I invest the group, okay, and, well, let me say like this, as I invest, what happens is, a loop happens here, okay? Through the influence of the society, of the group, the Creator influences me. And that causes elevation. Now, me and the Creator will never, ever have a one-to-one -one relationship. It's just sheer stupidity that man thinks he's special and he'll have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. If that was the case, the Creator would never have created the reality as it is with other people in it. So in order for us to come to this equivalence of form in the degrees of spirituality, I have to start training myself to bestow, to give, rather than to take. My effort in trying to give in the society, in the group, by studying Kabbalah, attracts what we call, just a minute ago in the other drawing, the light. The light's influence impacts the dot in the heart, which begins to grow and begins to sense spirituality. That way, I have my corporeal life, and on top of that, I've added a spiritual life through the study. Since the Creator is influencing everything in reality, what I've done is actually increase His influence on me by contributing personally. That is the whole of the study of Kabbalah. Okay, so just to Larry, you, you made us kind of jump through the whole course in a way. Uh, <laughs> when you said there's a method for getting out of one's own box, just to, to put it in a few words. So that, that method is the method of Kabbalah. The method of Kabbalah is the method for getting us out of our boxes, for getting us outside of perceiving only with the five senses and to perceive with what we could call an additional sense, which is the sense that can feel not the outcomes of those five senses, the outcomes being all kinds of pleasures that we receive uh, through the five senses, but the actual source of all of that, the source of all those pleasures. And we attain that source, which as we saw earlier is that light, is what the Kabbalists call light. 
And also, don't worry if uh, you know we, we went through many things just now. And we'll describe many things. We have full lessons on many of these elements. Like for example, we have a full lesson just on what it means to attract the surrounding light, and we have a full lesson on just defining those three means of attracting the surrounding light that Mutlu drew at the top right of that diagram, the, called the rav, the group, and the materials. All these things, for example, the method is the method of Kabbalah. The means in this method, or yeah, the, those are the rav, the group, and the materials. And by working with those in a certain way, we attract that light, which is what we're trying to attain equivalence of form with. So uh, it might seem a bit complicated, but at the end of the day, as also Motlu said a bit earlier, that the light is bringing us this whole perception of all these people out there. And this is actually a very unique thing about the method of Kabbalah. Anyone can start comparing all kinds of methods they've studied up until, day, uh, up until today with the Kabbalah now on this point, where often we hear about uh, some method of, of, uh, of some kind of spirituality telling us that you know, we have to detach ourselves from others and, and get into some kind of special internal state and, and, and do all kinds of... Uh, whether it's prayers or meditations or all kinds of things, as if by detaching ourselves from others, by that we become more spiritual. Rather, the wisdom of Kabbalah says the opposite. It says that everything outside of us, all of society, the whole of humanity, uh, really what we're trying to do here is, is, is see that the light is actually activating everything, is activating this whole reality we see, all the people and everything. And we can only reach that level of perception if we're really including ourselves as much as possible in society, including ourselves as much as possible in, in humanity, and trying to see through that, not just the face value uh, perception, because what's the face value perception? The face value perception is, is me perceiving everything as trying to uh, receive pleasure for myself. Like I only perceive other people by trying to rece receive pleasure from them. If they have some kind of equivalence of form with my ego, so then I'm closer to these people. If they don't, so then I'm further away from these people, uh, up to a point of even hating them, up until a point of even wanting to go to war with them, etc. So in order to get outside of this perception that we have, that egoistic perception that we're born into, uh, the method is to really uh, put ourselves into society as much as possible in order to discover not society itself, but that but what's the source of bringing all that into being? And the source is that light, is that quality of bestowal, that quality of love. And when we really learn how to reveal that between all people in society, so that's when a much better existence through this newly discovered sense that we are really exercising the whole time in the wisdom of Kabbalah, uh, that, that's what comes about. And that's when we truly discover spirituality, one which includes all other people together with that light. As we said, this is very, these are already advanced concepts, and we discuss these in much more detail, many of these concepts coming up into future lessons. For, for now, for the time being, this lesson's main purpose is just to show us that we perceive reality in a certain way through our five senses, and th that the cause of this is the will to receive pleasure that brings this whole perception into existence. Outside us is only not all kinds of things and people and elements that we uh, perceive. That's all a result of perceiving in the five senses. But outside of our whole perception is only what's called the light. And if we attain equivalence of form with that light, the light being opposite to our egoism, the light being altruism or bestowal or love, by working with this method to become equivalent to that light. So we gradually shift from our egoistic perception, which is only perceiving through the five senses, and we start developing that additional sense, which is seeded in us as that point in the heart. And then by working in this method, we literally nourish and, and grow that point in the heart to a point where it's actually uh, this new desire that we're perceiving out of and actually feeling reality out of. And that's the one where we perceive everything as this one inclusive, all people, the light, ourselves, everything as one whole. And that's when we reach a whole and complete perception of reality. So the gist of the, gist of the topic here is to really understand how we perceive reality and how equivalence of form is necessary okay, to perceive the creator. Now, equivalence of form is a very important topic because in reality, when we look at things, let's say here, 
I've got the remote control and I've got my cup of water. We depict closeness and uh, distance or further, how, how things are far from each other, by their distance, right? Now, in spirituality, we need to understand that closeness, um, equivalence of form, is a matter of quality, all right? It's, it's my quality that becomes close to the Creator, or it keeps me separated from the Creator. And this is why we have, in reality, just two things, okay? Positive and negative forces. One is bestowal, the attribute of the Creator, and one is reception, the attribute of the created being. So in order for us to really perceive the Creator, we need to come to this equivalence of form, all right? Which means that in character, in attributes, we are similar. Okay, that's the important thing here. Um, there are a few things we can read, okay, but if there are questions, I'd rather take them on, or we can read, what do you reckon, Marcus? Sure we'll read a bit through more. one more excerpt and then we Absolutely. can get to the question. Absolutely. Preface to the Wisdom of Kabbalah, um, five, page 570. Um, for, this, for this course, if you've got spare time, definitely worthwhile reading Kabbalah and Philosophy. Uh, introduction to the book of Zohar and this article preface to the wisdom of Kabbalah in order to get a good grasp of things. Page 570, item 13. I'm just going to read, um, read through the text that I've got here. You should understand that although the will to receive is a mandatory law in the creature, as it is the essence of the creature and the proper vessel, the clea, for reception of the goal of the thought of creation, it nonetheless completely separates it from the emanator. This is so because there is disparity of form to the point of oppositeness between itself and the emanator. This is because the emanator is complete bestowal without a shred of reception and the creature is complete reception without a shred of bestowal. Thus, there is no greater oppositeness of form than that. It therefore follows that this oppositeness of form necessarily separates it from the Creator. Okay, so this is why we don't feel the Creator in our world. We have no perception of the Creator simply because we just, we just have no touching point, no contact point, completely opposites. Okay, so this new sense, hopefully, this sixth sense that we're going to build should narrow that gap until we become completely separate from each other. Okay, like here. Until we slowly, slowly, gradually, if you can show the drawing bill. Thank you. So as we study Kabbalah, what we should be doing is narrowing the gap until we have a touching point and then we should have a greater equivalence of form until we just become one. Oops, God, what am I doing? Okay, until we could become one. Just like Marcos said a minute ago, when the whole of creation becomes perfection. All right, so this is the creator, this is man, okay? And hopefully, through the study of Kabbalah, we should start finding a common point with the creator. That's the dot in the heart, okay? We study more and more, okay? These, this is our reincarnations, let's say, okay? As our reincarnations bring us closer to the study of Kabbalah, and with the dot in the heart, we have our first contact point. Hopefully, we need to develop that because that's not enough to perceive the Creator. Okay, then we'll have a greater and then hopefully we'll finish it in this lifetime and attain perfection. All right, and that is the whole objective. So that is through the equivalence of form, all right, where the reception that we have, which is our essence that is talking about here, is used in order to bestow, which we will come to that. Just another short excerpt I'd like to read from Introduction to the Book of Zohar, item 40 on page 129. 
just gives us a nice little touch on understanding it. It says, they are like a worm that is born inside a radish. It lives there and thinks that the world of the Creator is as bitter, as dark, and small as the radish it was born in. But as soon as it breaks the shell off the radish and peeps out, it claims in bewilderment. I thought the whole world was the size of the radish I was born in, and now I see a grand, beautiful, and wondrous world before me. That's a nice little allegory. Um, so hopefully we'll crack out of the shell, out of that box, like this worm in the radish, and get to discover all the riches of spirituality. Uh, Eric from Grand Rapids in Michigan is asking, how is bestowal different than helping others? Um, helping others is, is all good. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, But here the whole idea of helping others and bestowing is not according to how we see it in our world, right? Just like I said a minute ago, we want to come to a form of equivalence of form with the Creator. It means I want to bestow just like the Creator wants to bestow. Now, I don't know how He's bestowing. Many books write about things like charity, you know, love, help your friend, help others, this and that. Okay, it's really nice and great, but that doesn't really solve my dilemma of discovering the Creator and what He really wants from me. Okay, so the whole idea of studying Kabbalah is actually to discover Him in order to really understand what He thinks bestowal is so I can do that. Because man tries to help each other. And also, you know, when they set up communist society uh, in, in Russia, when they had the communist uh, revolution, the guys who were doing it were really idealistic people. You know, they weren't... They weren't some kind of, um, they weren't uneducated or they didn't, it wasn't like they didn't know what they were planning to do. They really had an understanding that in order to live peacefully, we really need to bestow on one another. However, however, why does it fail? Why such an idealistic situation, which also seemingly matches the purpose of creation, fail? For one reason. It doesn't involve the Creator in it. You see, the purpose of creation is to discover the Creator, not to have a good, happy, chappy life here. All right? So that was their whole dysfunctioning point. Even though Russia has got more natural resources than any other country on the planet, more land, more water, more everything, okay? But if it doesn't go according to the laws of creation, Everything is bound to fail. So helping us, helping each other in this world also doesn't help. Look what they did in the 80s to Africa. You know, world aid. You know, we grew up in the 80s. It was this, you know, fad that we had to, you know, help the world, feed the hungry. And now Africa is just in a state of absolute civil war and turmoil. Man will never be able to do anything good at all even though he thinks he's doing good, nothing good will come out of it. Everything will just get worse the more we try to actually help each other out. Without the Creator inside this deal, it's a bad deal. And it won't, it won't eventuate. It's not going to bring any gain. Michelle from New York is asking, when we make a sacrifice for another person, is that ego fulfilling a desire of our own? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I feel good feel good you know that's you know that's what doing favors is to people i just feel good they respect me they love me but it's you know it's it's self-fulfillment this is actually a really good question a lot of people come to kabbalah and say but i do good things to other people as we study kabbalah right what happens is we begin to see the truth okay and then you think oh my god everything i did for my family my friends everyone around me that i thought i was doing good it actually gave me self-satisfaction. Okay, it's, it's actually nice to see the truth. So it's a nice question. There's a nice episode of Friends about that where <laughs> <laughs> they're looking for how to do a selfless deed and keep finding that everything you do for other people, you're always getting some kind of self-satisfaction out of. 
Uh, Anastasia from the UK is asking, do Kabbalists not have egoism at all? Well, we have the greatest egoism. I mean, just think about it. The rest of the world wants to make money and have a good, healthy life. We, we, want, to take, you know, we want to take the creator on board and say to the guy, listen, I want to rule the whole of reality. Okay, we have the biggest ego of all. However, that is a necessity in order to bestow. So, yeah, we, we, we're the greatest egos. We actually want to use the creator for ourselves, you know. Um, so we have the greatest ego, but having that huge ego is a benefit once you learn to use it for bestowal. So this is why it also says the creator created a huge desire to receive. Why? To receive all the light. So we, as humanity, have a huge ego. And yeah. it's, ne it's necessary. It's a necessity thing. This is why in, also here, sorry, mate. Yeah. Um, in the article here, it says um, we, he necessarily created us as a desire to receive. On the one hand, it separates us with this huge ego desire to receive for itself, uh, for itself. On the other hand, it's also the tool to actually unite with the Creator if we know how to use it correctly. I just wanted to add that uh, if we think back to that uh, diagram, and we see this diagram a lot of the development of desires, where the smallest, if you can show the uh, screen, Bill, what was getting to it. Yeah, this one here. So you see there, the smallest level of desire is the still, then the vegetative, then the animate, then the human. So the still level is food, sex, family, shelter. That's the levels of desires. Then the vegetative is desires for money, as it's expressed in, in us. And then at the animate level, you're getting bigger desires for honor, control, knowledge. And in that last biggest level of egoism, that's when the desire for spiritually pops up. It, it seems, I understand where it's coming from, because it seems like the spiritual people are the ones with the smallest egoism, uh, you know, spirituality, you're thinking about doing good to others, etc., etc. It's like people who have less ego, right? How can it be that the people with the biggest egos are the ones that have a desire for spirituality? Uh, the way it really becomes expressed is that the biggest egoism, because all these things, it's food, sex, family, money, honor, control, knowledge, uh, we start feeling that these things don't fulfill me. Maybe, maybe we get all kinds of transient fulfill, fulfillments from those other levels of desire for sure. But there's always some kind of additional space that this additional egoism brings us, which is never getting fulfilled. And that, that's the sign of the point in the heart popping up in a person. And that's a sign of the greatest egoism in the person popping up, where the person has such a big ego that now he wants the creator. He doesn't know that he wants the creator at that point. It's still, uh, it's still an unclarified desire, but he's literally feeling, what does it mean that I want the creator? It means that all, of all these things, I'm feeling this additional emptiness, this, this, this feeling that I'm not, not getting fulfilled by all those things, and I want something more or different to what I have now, and that's what's pushing us through all these spiritual searches from one environment to the next, one technique to the next, one book to the next, and, and searching for that, for all these pieces of the puzzle to come together, precisely because... Uh, people who come to Kabbalah have got that biggest ego, and it's perfectly normal. It's, this is the natural process of creation, and this is why we say we're not here to suppress the ego and try to make it smaller and, and try to uh, do, do what we can with less, but rather with all that big desire we have, we're here to learn how it functions, what's operating on it, and how to actually develop it in the most correct way. And, and developing it in the most correct way is by attracting that additional force, that force of the light, in order to balance it. Meaning that we learn how to attract that positive source of creation above this ego and start working with these two, uh, two layers simultaneously. And, and our ego will keep growing as well, but we'll keep developing that connection with that positive force above it. That's the whole advancement in the wisdom of Kabbalah, always finding the creator, that positive force of bestowal and love, above the growing ego, which is constantly uh, growing like this. Maybe we have time just for one more question. Uh, we're going a bit over time, but... Uh, last question. Vadim from Fort Lauderdale. Uh, is it really possible to achieve? Do you know real people who already live outside of their five senses and that their life changed? Um, Vadim, I think when you start studying Kabbalah, life changes. <laughs> okay? Because first of all, 
What does it mean to change? It means that I add to myself um, a new approach to life. Now, spirituality is inner change. So when you look at a Kabbalist from the outside, you don't really see something different. You know, he sits like you, he eats like you, he sleeps like you. He, you know, he does normal things like everybody else. Okay? On the other hand, on the side, he studies Kabbalah as well, just like any other guy has a hobby. Right? Some people like to go fishing, some people like to collect stamps, some people like to paint, and this guy studies Kabbalah. So when you look from the outside, you can't really tell anything different. This is why spirituality is in a change. It's all happening inside of a person. This is why perception of reality is inside of us. It's never going to be something like I see on the outside, but from the influence I get from the outside, it's going to be an internal change of how I see, how I feel, how I intend. And that will, that will be the uh, you know, tipping point, flipping to another perception of reality. That's why Kabbalah is called also the hidden wisdom. It's really hidden. I can only and only determine things that are inside of me as I reveal them from me. And therefore, I will never be able to judge another person. I can never say that this person has done right or wrong or he sinned or didn't sin. You just can't judge anyone simply because you only feel everything inside yourself. Okay? However, these texts, the way that the Kabbalists have kind of written everything to us, when we have that point in the heart, it influences us. It gives us a sensation that when I'm reading these materials, when I'm working and studying, something inside of you settles. It says, you know what? I think I, I nailed it this time. And this time, I think I found what I was looking for. So it's very, very important when you come to the study of Kabbalah to, to really see how you feel inside in that sensation. Is this right for me? Am I feeling, yeah, I found it. That is a very, very um, important sensation that you need to keep an eye out for. All right, we're getting over time. Uh, in any case, uh, soon I'll just go through some announcements that we have and then soon we'll go out with another video clip uh, with uh, Rav Leitman explaining some more things about the perception of reality. Uh, just a few things about that. There's actually a video. This isn't in the official announcements, but just something I'd like to recommend that if you're interested in this topic about perception of reality, maybe you can uh, write this out. Uh, then there's a movie of Rav's visit to San Francisco a few years ago where he met with a few scientists, uh, scientists who appeared in this movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? It's a movie that many... Uh, people who are seekers, many people who've had the point in the heart have gone through at some point. Uh, so he met with these scientists and he actually w was showing them the principles of the wisdom of Kabbalah. And there was a movie made about it. And really, this whole movie, it's all about perception of reality. It's, it's all t talking about where science was in, with perception of reality, where Kabbalah comes in. So this movie, you can find it if you go to kabbalah.info. And then on the left-hand column, you just click on the Kabbalah Worldwide category. And then in the Kabbalah Worldwide category, you just click on What the Bleep, which is under Events. And there you'll have all the materials, including that movie. Uh, it's called What the Bleep Meets Kabbalah, or Ups and Downs in San Francisco. So it's something that you can go, it's something like 35 minutes long, that movie. And yeah, if you're, again, if you're interested in this topic and you want to clarify a lot of these things, I know there's more questions about it here, that's definitely something you can do to, to get deeper into it. Uh, next lesson is this coming Wednesday, April the 29th. I also just want to mention that this Wednesday, April the 29th, is the last day that this course is open for enrollment. So if you want to invite any of your friends, if you think that it's suitable for any friends or family or anyone you know, uh, just let them know that it's this Wednesday is the cutoff point, so so don't miss out if that's the situation. Kabbalah Bookstore right now is offering a 15% discount on all our books for these courses, uh, just for EC students. 
So if you use the promotion code EC15 off, we are looking right there, meaning that if you go to the bookstore and order books and then in the section where that you can enter a promotion code, uh, write EC15 off there. Well, there's writing it there at the bottom. So then you can use that to, to get this discount and you can follow along with us in the lessons in the textbooks. And other than that, any comments, questions, problems of any kind, technical problems, etc., uh, just shoot an email to ec at kabbalah.info and we'll be happy to deal with it. Forum. And the forum as well, if you have any questions about the materials, for example, there's lots of unanswered questions here, you can also take them to the, to the student forum to look for answers there. Thanks, Motlu. Thank you, Marcos, and hopefully we'll see you next time. Have a great evening, have a great day. See you later. We saw this movie. What do you call the movie? What the bleep do we know? Okay, so simply, there are eight international scientists. It all started when we saw the film, What the Bleep Do We Know? We are members of the World Academy of Kabbalah, headed by Rav Michael Leitman. Having seen the film, we were surprised at how close modern science has come to confirming the Kabbalistic view of the universe. Scientists specializing in quantum physics have discovered on their own the depth of matter described by Kabbalists more than 3,000 years ago. And we decided to go meet with them. So they give a very good example. They say that an Indian is standing on the beach and he looks into the ocean and Columbus ships start arriving, but he doesn't see the ships. Why can't he see them? Because he doesn't have in his mind the same model as a big house that floats on the sea. The truth is that they're wrong because the ship doesn't exist either. It only exists in the imagination of whoever imagines. This world doesn't exist. But what do I want to say? What about this example is good? If you don't have the vessels, you don't recognize anything on the outside. How do I build a vessel inside of me if I don't know what something is on the outside of me? I need somebody to tell me about it. There's no other way. That's why the Kabbalistic sages write books for you, for us. And according to these books, you start imagining what's out there. And from this imagination, slowly you build patterns and some kinds of shapes in your mind. For sure, they're not correct, but slowly, by longing, by desire, you invite a light that is building shapes more and more close to what it is. And then you start reaching that point where you can actually see. The light is built within the vessel. Imagine that a caveman just appeared right now into this world, like you see sometimes in the movies. So he's in this world and he's walking around and he's seeing everything that's happening. But he wouldn't be able to see anything, nothing. So can this Indian pass through this wall? Yes, he can. He has no sense of it, and it's not there for him. For him, there's no material and not a shape dressed in the material. Simple as that. If we get away from the way we usually see, we'll come to the true point that the Kabbalists are telling us that seems so strange to us. And those scientists who study quantum physics, why do they come to this realization? At that deepest sub-nuclear level of our reality, 
you and I are literally one. 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 Because they enter a world that has strange rules. Suddenly, one thing can be in two places. Or time and space and movement can be in another shape. And they come to this same thought. Everything depends on the one who perceives it. And that's why whether you pass through the wall or you don't, exists only towards me, but it doesn't exist on its own. And what does towards me mean? It means, according to my vessels, it will be yes or no. Only in this world we're born with five vessels, and we develop from one generation to the next. So a child is born and immediately begins to develop in such a way that he's in an environment and in a world that grows along with him. He's the one who captures the world and it becomes a fact to him. All the rest, the shapes, everything is immaterial. And he's the one who gives it meaning through his five senses. All these five senses are the way that we get things and we produce these things according to what they manufacture. Can we reach the wisdom of Kabbalah through quantum physics? No. Otherwise, Abraham would have dealt with quantum physics first. They're talking about love and it's all one world because they're feeling a movement towards this form. But how do you implement this? Quantum physics can't answer this because this is the upper force. If we, the ones who really feel from within the heart, the point in the heart, the desire to go back to spirituality and feel it, we begin to learn about our situation up here. And that's the wisdom of Kabbalah. So we learn about us being here, when in fact we are already in that state, but we don't feel it. But by wanting in our blocked states to awaken and feel the true state, if we learn about our true situation, we draw on ourselves. It's as if we draw the light that's present there. Because I'm in that world, in that state, I just don't, I'm not aware of it. But if I make every effort to become conscious of it, to be awakened, my desire, my impulse to do it opens up my additional vessels and then we begin to feel spirituality. What does that mean? We begin to feel how we are all interconnected as one body and then through each and every one infinite light follows endlessly and without any limitations and all the problems that we feel today in the world is only so as to force humanity to begin to go back up. You know, I had been studying physics and I knew something about that technology, but Kabbalah as a science was something that never would have even dawned on me. I don't care what you're doing, there is something about this field of way of thinking, of seeing, which can improve anything. And I don't care if you're a Jew, a Muslim, Gentile, Arab, I don't care what you are, I don't care what nationality, I don't care what religion you belong to. Kabbalah will help liberate your mind from any shackles of thought that keep you ensconced or enclosed into a certain way of thinking. Now, if these words are awakening you right now, you know it. If they're not awakening you right now, then I'm suggesting to you that you've fallen asleep. Well, it, it does have a, an awful lot to say. I don't hear anything, I don't see anything, but I feel. There are these 
three-dimensional pictures like wallpapers. If you look at them and you defocus your eye, then you go into the picture and you find a three-dimensional picture. Random. When you look at it at the beginning, it looks like just a jagged random pattern. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, you see a, a right. kind of flat mm -hmm. yeah. 3D image emerge. But I As, uh, so these things. <laughs> So, what the wisdom of Kabbalah actually does is it helps you get that picture. It doesn't do anything new, actually. It just focuses and aims your attributes and everything in you in such a way that you begin to see into matter.